Hi. Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today, we're continuing our conversation with Todd Boss, the tremendously talented poet whose first book, Yellow Rocket, was published by W.W. W. Norton in 2008 and spent several weeks on the poetry bestseller list. The collection was released in paperback this spring. That's an honor usually reserved for major poets who have impacted the field for decades. Todd is going to tell us more about his writing and why he thinks it resonates with so many readers. He'll talk about some of his current efforts, including motion poems, an innovative project that combines poetry and video. He'll also read some more of his poems and share details about his amazing journey from Farmer's Son to the Playwrights Center in Minneapolis to his current status, Poetry All-Star, as one critic calls him. I'm thrilled to welcome Todd Boss to the set once again. Todd, thank you for coming back. Thanks, Liz. So you're going to open with another poem? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I'll read The Wallpaper. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Uh, it's a poem. The, the book, uh, Yellow Rocket, is centrally concerned with turbulence, the turbulence of uh, farm life, the turbulence of a storm that came through uh, our 80 acres when we lived there and took down a lot of the trees that we loved, uh, and the turbulence of marriage, uh, which um, I married a very, uh, uh, I don't know what to call her, she's a contradictory person, let's say, and, uh, and I love her for that reason. Uh, but it, it always ends up uh, in, uh, you know, uh, putting us in all kinds of uh, arguments and resolutions uh, as we learn to live with one another. Uh, so this is a poem uh, written after an argument. It's called The Wallpaper. The wallpaper says hello. The wallpaper misses you something awful. The wallpaper can't stop wondering when you were thinking of coming home. The clocks moved on. The sinks, ten million tears, are dry. Our floors have gotten over you, or so they claim and claim. The windows clearly feel the same, but call me. Call me soon, my love, and tell me what to say. Next time, the fading and tedious wallpaper whispers your beautiful household name. Mm, I love that poem. And I think that's another great example of why your work really connects with people. Because there isn't a person on this planet who hasn't had an argument with a loved one and has wanted to say the kinds of things you said in that poem. Most people can't find the words to do that, but you did it for them, for all of us. Hmm. Yeah, I, just using common household objects and the, you know, the environment of being alone in the house, um, zeroing in on that experience rather than elaborating on it or you know, drawing some kind of artistic illusion about it to classical literature or something. Mm -hmm. You know, just talking about the things and the place and the sounds of being alone in the house, yeah, I think is what uh, delivered me through that poem as the, as the poet. And then wanting to, wanting to experience it again, the heartbreak of that loneliness f as a reader, mm. you know, drove me to want to almost snapshot that and keep it in a way yeah. that I would remember what that, what that loneliness felt like, you mm -hmm. know? And that's an interesting comment. Some of our viewers would probably say, oh, well, why would he want to remember it? Why mm. would he want to relive mm. something painful? Yeah, I think, I think that's what the poet is drawn to do. I think a poet wants to capture all of life, the bitter and the sweet, you know? Um, I think that's what makes us different from, you know, people who make commercial uh, work for a living. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to sugarcoat anything. You know, these are not Hallmark cards. Mm -hmm. These are slices of my life, um, like insects pinned down in a 
in a shadow box mm -hmm. so that I can admire them in all their ugliness and frightfulness and beauty, uh, you know, all at the same time under an intense, the intense light that poetry can, can offer. Mm -hmm. As I was listening to that poem, I thought about something you said during our first conversation, and you were talking about your optimistic nature, mm -hmm. even in the face of heartbreak. What I like about that poem is that, yes, it's about turbulence, but it's also about coming through mm. turbulence. And I think that's why so many of your poems have such a powerful impact, because they don't just stay in the hurt, they don't stay in the pain, they move through it. And people need to see that. They need to know how do other people do this. Hmm. Because just sticking with the pain, well, so what? Everybody's got pain. Mm -hmm. But when you show someone that it's possible hmm. to move through it, that opens up all new possibilities. Hmm. That's interesting. The section about my turbulent marriage, as I put it, gets pretty turbulent. I mean, uh, some of the poems in here are um, at the breaking point of the marriage. Um, and when you said unflinching in your, I thought of, I thought of some of those. Um, but yeah, you know, um, marriage can be ugly, you know. Farm life can be ugly, you know. It's easy to be nostalgic about anything when you look back on it. But even child raising can have its ugly, sad, and um, really depressing moments. But, um, you know, I think that only makes the good parts all the better if you can, uh, if you can hold those both in, in the balance of your mind and, and, and somehow try to equal them out. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you are still married and that you love her not just in spite of the differences, but that that's also something that you do love about her, I think that gives people permission to work with turbulence and mm. challenges instead of feeling that, oh, we've got to cover it up, we've got to bottle it yeah. up. Yeah, I think contemporary American culture is a lot about the happy ending mm -hmm. and sort of the sweet idyllic image of two people and their kids living together in a suburban home. And there's something sort of a lie about that because instead most of us are interested and are driven and drawn to opposites you know we find someone attractive you know partly because they challenge us a little mm -hmm. bit and then we grow to resent that and we grow to you know hate that and sometimes we grow apart we say we grow apart and we and we and we disband it completely um, but if we embrace it um, then I think there's a richer uh, richer set of circumstances there mm -hmm. definitely now before we came in here I was doing some research and looked up some quotes of yours online and I found one that was fascinating because you were telling an interviewer about how you believe that poetry is for the heart, not the head. And the quote is, I like to say I have them by the heart because the idea of poetry is to get at the heart. It's not to get at the memory or the head. It's to get somewhere else and the place where you store your meaning and the things that mean a good deal to you. Hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, they're not, they're not rational arguments, poems. You know, they're built to work on a different level. They're built to work on the imagination because of the images that they present. Mm -hmm. They're designed then also to evoke the emotions. Um, they're designed to stir some kind of a gut response, like like you get when you're in a flight or f uh, fight or flight situation. You know, um, uh, I think poetry is capable of all that, and maybe even a spiritual sort of 
light or a spiritual awareness that we might not be cognitive of either when we read a poem. Um, so, you know, I think if you want to be rational, you can write philosophy or you can write other kinds of, uh, you know, journalism or other kinds of, uh, you know, sort of rational pursuits. But I think if you want to move people on multiple levels, poetry is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Many people say that, oh, poetry, I mean, it just can't <laughs> connect with people today. Yeah. I mean, it's an archaic art form. <laughs> But you don't buy that. No. Okay. So when you're writing, you often use very subtle rhymes mm. and you have internal rhymes. Is there a connection, do you think, between the rhyme and the sound mm -hmm. in your work mm -hmm. and the fact that it's reaching people who aren't supposed to like poetry? I like to think so. Um, most people have a much more sophisticated sense of music than they're willing to admit, I think. I think that our culture is rife with interesting music playing in the background at, you know, you go to the grocery store, you go wherever you go, and there's always some soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And um, that is subtly training our minds to listen to, um, you know, different ideas about music. Uh, balance and symmetry and uh, closure and uh, you know, delay and all kinds of things that music can do. And I think poetry, um, when it's uh, musical, taps that in the listener or the hearer or the reader and um, stirs, a, stirs a response that, as I say, may be sort of an animal response or it might be something on the, the left brain as opposed to the right brain or I've got that backwards maybe. Um, you know, but it comes from somewhere else other than just what the words mean. It's how the words sound and what the music does to the body and to the mind. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the reasons that you have done so much work to get poetry out to readers in non-traditional forms? And I'm thinking of two ways that you're doing that. The first is with Flurry, mm -hmm. you are online magazine mm -hmm. and the second is with motion poems. Mm -hmm. So tell us first a little bit about Flurry. Flurry is um, a seasonal online journal uh, of poems about snow and winter weather from poets who have some connection to Minnesota. That was the first year. The second year we launched it uh, and we opened it up to Wisconsin poets as well. The third year we, so it's growing a little bit in terms of the region that it covers. Um, but it only runs from the, we only put it up on uh, line from uh, the winter solstice through the spring equinox and then we take it down. It's just a periodic journal of poems about snow and bad weather. Um, Motion Poems is an effort uh, to capitalize on poetry's multiple ways of communicating. A poem is a literary artifact, kind of at its base, but its history is as an oral art form. Mm -hmm. And so it's also a work of music meant to be spoken out loud and heard. Um, it's also a bit of movie making because it's about tends to be about images and it evokes the imagination. It's making a movie in your head as you're listening. So um, a friend and I came up with the idea of animating poems as a way to illustrate that to people and make poems more accessible in those other formats as well. And so far we've, um, we've put together about 15, 20 of these at motionpoems.com. Uh, my poems and the poems of other poets that we admire. And it's gathering steam. We've had a couple of uh, um, screenings in Minneapolis St. Paul where I live that have been well attended and um, people seem to really enjoy them. When I was in the MFA program at Cornell, Robert Morgan was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And Bob always used to say that video going to be the future of poetry. Mm. He said that's the way we're really going to connect 
with a mass audience. So let's take a look at one of your poems, Don't Come Home. What's really interesting to me about this is that it conveys the music of the poem in some fascinating ways, but there's also the visual element, which is appealing. I watched that video two or three times and was mesmerized mm -hmm. every time by the way the words moved mm -hmm. across the screen. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at that. Okay. Don't Come Home ranks first among the worst things someone you love can say. Not even the common I hate you does the damage don't come home will do. You can live with I hate you, same as you live with the past. You abide it. I hate you, in fact, can be worth coming home to, like anything built to last. I hate you. Maybe the mythical two in the bush, the bird in the hand is worth, while don't come home, by contrast, is that first bird, caught bird, scared to sing its song. Percussive wings held, fist fast, just so long. Now when you look at that poem and you see it, you know, someone stepping back and trying to look through the eyes of viewers, what stands out to you? Hmm. Uh, maybe just the directness of it, you know? Um, and also kind of the violence of it the black and whiteness of it. Um, the animator really embraced the sort of violent tone of it and through those, you know, through those words uh, at the viewer, you know, really harshly. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of nasty of the animator to have done. Um, but it gets the idea across, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of an uncomfortable video to watch, to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a happy video, uh, but I think that's the point. Mm -hmm. And I think what you said is right on the mark that the animator threw the words at people. And the poem is all about throwing words, the words that really hurt. Hmm. But as with all of your work, people come away from it feeling better, feeling hmm. hopeful. Hmm. And I say that because Many people I know who are fans of your work and are not poets have said that very thing. Hmm. Oh, make sure to tell him how much we like his stuff. It always <laughs> makes us feel better when we hmm. read it or watch it. Hmm. You are now working on a second book, mm -hmm. and you have a great video about one of those poems. And the poem is called The God of Our Farm Had Blades. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at that. And then I want to hear your thoughts about it, because it's very different from Don't Come Home. Yeah. The god of our farm had blades and a rudder. All our acres begged its pardon. Merest breezes made its rusty flower turn and whine and shudder. Its wooden arm a weathered stump. The god of our farm no longer pumped the well that still it lorded power over. It belonged to another order. On silent nights in summer, windows open. Many times its vocal powers found me deep in dreams and hauled me up. Unearthly alarm, what ache. How the vein would groan, the rotor churn. And with what moan when a good gust came. It scared me to the bone, as if some inner tower of my own for an unknown water yearned. So when you look at that mm -hmm. video again, what stands out? 
Uh, that one's much more cinematic. You know, it takes a much more, um, it's, it, it's in a movie mind, that one. Um, the animator actually went to an old farm, took a lot of photographs, collaged them together, and then animated the whole thing. So, um, so that one has a lot more character and color and warmth and depth to it. Um, I think that one is trying to get at the spiritual nature of, the, of that old windmill. Um, the, the hairs on the back of my neck still stand up when he makes that old windmill groan mm -hmm. in, the, in that mm -hmm. piece. He doesn't do it a lot, even though the poem is all about that sound. He only gives us one little groan in the video, and I just love the way that, just the, love the way that grabs me. It really puts me back to when I was a kid, and that was, that was what I was hearing as a kid from that old windmill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't answer that the way you wanted. No, you did. That was perfect. <laughs> no, I had no expectations, okay. except that your answer would be good, mm -hmm. and it was. What I like about that video is that it's so rich. The images, they're just gorgeous, and there's something slightly sad about them, slightly haunting, mm -hmm. and especially when the little boy is standing by the window. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, it's a lonely poem. It's almost like that little boy is on the edge of the prairie, you know, and there's nobody mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's, you know, part of it too, this idea of comforting my reader. You know, I'm glad that readers find something in my work that makes them feel uh, human again, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not because I've tried to pacify them. It's not because I've tried to make them feel comfortable. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like any reader will get a thrill out of anything that reaches for where they live and where they feel and where the heart is. It's kind of like, you know, it's a bad analogy, but why do we go to, you know, why do we go to horror movies? You know, it's not because there's a happy ending. It's because we love to be scared to death. You know, we love to be reached in a place that, that stirs our blood and reminds us of our, you know, our instinctual mind, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's kind of what I'm reaching for. And I think you do achieve that. And maybe the reason why many of the readers I've heard from will say, oh, I do get such a sense of comfort, or however they would describe it. I think it's because you do remind them of who they are. Hmm. You keep everything real. Hmm. And really, is there any better consolation than to see who and what you really are? Yeah. And ultimately, we're pretty conflicted, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we share that with one another, you know, all of us. Um, I don't know anybody that has a life that doesn't have something conflicting about it, something mm -hmm. difficult, something challenging. And so I think um, the mode of most of my work is, um, you know, to kind of reconcile that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you do it beautifully. Tell us a little bit about your writing process, and especially where you write. I write all over town. Uh, I don't have an office in the house, so I end up um, I end up going to libraries and cafes and uh, places where I can kind of just steal a table and have a cup of coffee and uh, get free Wi-Fi. Um, the library is a favorite, but I've become the poet laureate of my local coffee house in St. Paul. Nina's Cafe is a, just a really comfortable place to write, and I was going there for a while, and finally I um, told the manager, you know, this place needs a poet laureate, and she said, well, I have no idea what you mean by that, but I agree, <laughs> and so I became kind of their poet laureate, and what I do there uh, to sort of earn the title and a little bit of free coffee once in a while mm -hmm. is to host a reading series there, so um, I, it's a way for me to be part of the community, um, but not just take from it, um, give back to it, and uh, make a home uh, where I've found a home for other writers too. So that's what that's about. Mm -hmm. And that's another great example of how you are a connector. You mm -hmm. do it with your writing, you do it with the flurry, you do it with the videos, mm -hmm. you do it with the fact that you are so 
open to listening to people who just want to tell you how much they like hmm. your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know what to say about that. <laughs> so would you close with another poem? Yeah. Um, let's see. Hmm. I'm not sure what to read, but uh, maybe um, The Day is Gray and the Lake? Yes. Yeah? I uh, love that one. Yeah. Uh, I actually wrote this up on a lake in northern Wisconsin. Um, and it's just an observation poem, just a series of observations, and kind of a meditation on the nature of God as, a, as an idea. God as an idea of the universe as creative generative. The day is gray and the lake shifts mercurial like modeling clay. The million thumbs of wind at work upon it. The artist unable to come to a single conclusion. Just what shape should this cold lake take this morning? And the trees surrounding. The maker can't make up his mind, always fussing. He shuffles the shoreline shadows like a paint chip deck. The reeds, the nervous birds, the toads, forever lost on mud's malleable maps. Everything's a mess and genius all at once, a school for unruliness. Even the stones second-guess themselves, eroding. And there, a wash of sunshine and some people boating. Mm. I love that poem. Thanks. Thank you.